In this podcast episode, we want to introduce you to our BCEN friend, Bruce Hoffman. Come along as Michael Dexter and Holly Briggs talk with Bruce about his career in nursing, from pre-hospital to transport, and his passion for all things cardiac. Bruce is sure to create a thirst for knowledge during this conversation. This episode is called, Might As Well Jump Into Education and Knowledge. Hello, and welcome to the BCN and Friends podcast, where we hold interesting conversations about learning with a range of thought leaders, BCN certification holders, and industry professionals. But most importantly, to create value and insight for you, our professional nurses across the emergency spectrum. We hope you find our discussions interesting, informative, sometimes funny, sometimes serious, but always valuable. I'm Holly Briggs, a professional development specialist at BCN and one of your hosts for today. I'm joined by my co-host, Michael Dexter, Director of Professional Development at BCN. Hi, Michael. Hello, Holly. Great to be with you again. It's great to have you. In this episode of BCN and Friends, we have Bruce Hoffman. Bruce is a critical care nurse with a background in pre-hospital education and advanced practice nursing. Michael, could you please introduce us to our BCN and friend, Bruce? Yes, I would be happy to. Bruce is a critical care registered nurse and paramedic, and his clinical background includes the ICU and the ER, as well as trauma, cardiology, and critical care transport and flight. He holds graduate degrees in education and advanced practice. Bruce has spoken at multiple conferences and has a passion for education. He lives in Connecticut with his wife, Stephanie, who's also a nurse, and their three beautiful children, Ava May, Adeline Liu, and Jackson Lee as well as their Boston Terrier, Bella. Bruce, welcome to the BCN and Friends podcast. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. And Holly, good to be with you uh, here. Yeah, we're excited to talk with you. And um, I first heard you speak in person at a FAST conference uh, in the past. And I know you've done a lot with education. And as we mentioned, all sorts of areas you've worked, but can you just kind of recap and tell us a little bit more about your career and how that's changed over the years? I uh, graduated uh, nursing school back in the early 2000s. Previous to going to nursing school, I was an emergency medical technician coming out of uh, high school, and I was working in a uh, large level one trauma center as a uh, ER tech. And I really loved what uh, what I was doing. And so that uh, I did that while I was in nursing school. I graduated from an associate degree nursing program from a uh, local community college. That really has actually impacted my my career far more than I ever would have thought, especially the uh, you know, the further that I got into education and really coming to have a respect for those um, associate degree programs that are out there. Um, once I graduated, I went to work at, again, a, a large level one trauma facility and uh, started on a heart failure step down unit uh, for a few months and then transitioned off to the cardiac and uh, medical surgical intensive care unit uh, where I worked and then uh, moved into the cardiac catheterization lab and electrophysiology lab. Um, and I worked there for uh, probably five or six years, um, you know, kind of in in that area, and and really kind of came to love all things all things cardiac. Um, so after working in cardiology for a number of years, uh, I moved down to Baltimore, Maryland, uh, kind of right outside the uh, Washington D.C. Uh, Beltway, and uh, worked down at the Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. Uh, and did some uh, light clinical teaching for Johns Hopkins University and the School of Nursing there, and really enjoyed it. And that was really my first experience into the transport realm. And it really allowed me to kind of aggregate, if you will, all of the skills that I had, you know, kind of mastered up and through that point, and and be able to, uh, you know, now kind of treat uh, patients in the in the transport environment. Prior to me moving down there, I had also completed a uh, one year paramedic um, certificate certificate program. Uh, so I was able to transition not only from an EMT to a paramedic, but also from uh, an associate degree nurse to a, a baccalaureate degree nurse, you know, through an RN to BSN program uh, at the university that I now teach at. Uh, so kind of all of that culminated, uh, and I was able to really enjoy critical care transport for a little while down in the mid-Atlantic, again, through uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital, 
they had a very interesting model of, of critical care transport. You worked on a transport team in the facility, transporting people from intensive care units down to various procedures or transporting patients from the emergency room all throughout the hospital. The um, the Johns Hopkins Hospital sits really inner city Baltimore, and but there are like literally miles of tunnels uh, underneath that really connect all the various buildings. And so having a team that's able to transport critically ill patients throughout that facility uh, really became imperative. So I was able to be part of that and kind of witness its development and growth. Um, and then we also spent time out uh, in the ambulance, the aircraft. They also had a fixed wing uh, program there, uh, allowing for uh, both domestic and international uh, transports as well. Um, while I was down there, I met my wife, uh, Stephanie. She was a neurocritical care nurse and uh, one of the uh, folks that worked in the neurocritical care unit. Uh, and it was kind of a love at first sight. Uh, I had been keeping my eye on her a little bit. She was always seems to be in a good mood, always very happy. Uh, and so kind of in a, an immediate love story, we uh, uh, moved back uh, to Connecticut here, uh, got married in 2014, and uh, have since had three children. From there, uh, I obtained a master's degree in nursing education from Western Governors University, had a great experience there. Uh, worked for a short time as a clinical educator, uh, and then uh, really uh, started, you know, kind of figuring out where and what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, at that time, I uh, hooked up with uh, Eric Bauer, got uh, in, in, you know, kind of invested in the uh, Flight Bridge Ed, um, leading to its eventual sale over to LifeLink 3. Um, and also during that time, I, uh, uh, after my uh, master's in nursing, I got a um, postmaster certificate in family nurse practitioner studies uh, from Morningside uh, College while I was teaching uh, at Goodwin University. Uh, my first faculty position there uh, was in the RN to BSN program. It was an online program allowing for lots of flexibility and doing some uh, schooling on the side. Uh, and then uh, just recently stepped into the director um, of the associate degree nursing program there, and that is my current role. I still work clinically up at uh, a hospital in Springfield, Massachusetts, helping out with the development of a ground critical care transport team. So I have a nice blend of working a little bit in academia, um, but also working in uh, clinical practice. But that's kind of the culmination, uh, kind of chronologically through my you know time here uh, as a uh, nurse and as a uh, paramedic. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. That's very interesting to see how different doors open up and how different people have uh, progressions in their nursing career over time. And you know, I wanted to even bring, go back to your days in the cath lab and things because I, I worked in that area as well for a while. And from an ED standpoint and a pre-hospital standpoint, a lot of times we get patients to the cath lab or, or the cath lab team comes and picks them up and we never see them again. And we kind of just think, oh, cath lab, they just open up blockages in the heart for patients with heart attacks and that's all they do. And then when I worked there, I found out there's so much more from scheduled cardioversions to electrophysiology studies to um, a lot of different electrical and even like tilt table tests and things. But can you tell us a little bit more about um, that time in cardiology and how it really opened up your perspective to things like hemodynamics and monitoring and those real, real deep critical care um, topics? Yeah, for sure. So great, um, you know, that it's easy for me to do that because it was such a, a good time in life. Um, you know, I think for for a number of reasons, you know, the bedside um, nursing, either in the intensive care unit or in step down units, it's very exhausting, right? You know, it's, it's great work, but it's very tiring. And obviously, all of this was pre pandemic. Uh, and it was it was pretty challenging back then. Um, and one of the things that really tipped the scale for me going to a procedure area was it was somewhat scheduled, but then like part of it was totally unscheduled and super chaotic, right? So it kind of filled um, filled the bottle for me on on two ends. One, it was very kind of uh, organized and you kind of did similar things all the time. There were great opportunities to learn. There were always reps and other physicians that would come into our lab and provide feedback or education. Um, but then, you know, after your 6 p.m., you know, your last case leaves and you are on call, 
at three o'clock in the morning, you know, you're getting woken up out of a sound sleep to uh, come ripping back in, uh, you know, for for either a STEMI or to place a pacemaker, uh, you know, a, a temporary uh, pacemaker or even an intraortic balloon pump on a sick cardiogenic shock patient. So uh, it really touched on two very, um, very uh, core pieces of, of who I am. You know, I one of the things that I routinely suggest to people is that I feel like we spend a lot of time in nursing school and paramedic school covering cardiac related um, pathologies, but very rarely do we really get that hardcore kind of basic fundamental foundational understanding of really how the heart works, blood flow through the heart, purpose of valves, uh, et cetera. And then the whole hemodynamic piece, right, um, is, is kind of on top of that. There's just really a never ending uh, kind of uh, ability to, to learn. There's always something new that's coming through. Um, but we can always relate it back to kind of that foundational understanding of native uh, anatomy and physiology. Um, I will say that it also really helped propel my career uh, because I, you know, you get to see kind of, you know, hemodynamics are not a thing that you encounter once a month or, you know, twice a year. They're things that you encounter every day, right? You, you, you know, you'll put in a, a Swan-Gans or pulmonary artery catheter and get some measurements and then talk about and see really live maybe how some of the medication or the medical management uh, allows that patient uh, to get better, right? Pairing kind of their advanced hemodynamics with uh, some of the management that was going on. So it was really uh, uh, very much a, a total uh, eclipse for me, if you will, right? I, it gave me such good insight and 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 it challenged uh, kind of all sorts of standards, right? So I, I remember, and I think Michael, you and I talked about this maybe the first time we chatted, um, you know, when they do, uh, you know, maybe when they'll do studies to look at whether a blockage is actually the culprit of maybe somebody's acute coronary syndrome or, 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 or such, they'll place a patient on an adenosine infusion, right? That used to be one of the things that we would do. And I remember hearing that for the first time, you know, I had always heard adenosine as like, oh, it was 6, 12, and 12 for like, you know, supraventricular, you know, tachydysrhythmias and things like that. But yet here we're starting them on like 140 mics per kilogram per minute of an adenosine infusion and just understanding like why we did that and and uh, and that kind of thing. It just kind of blew your mind a little bit. It, it opened up uh, my mind uh, a lot. Um, and so I never lost my love for that. You know, I think the first time that you see somebody you know, have a totally occluded right coronary artery, bradycardic, hypotensive, sick, not feeling well. And then to be able to float a wire, you know, past, you know, past that uh, kind of inflammatory process and crack the plaque, if you will, with a balloon and then place a stent and then see the result. I don't think anybody uh, that has ever worked in that kind of arena will ever forget that kind of first time experience. Just really loved and enjoyed kind of my time that I have spent and I still have uh, a true respect and passion for kind of all things cardiac. Thank you for sharing that. And again, I, I mean, to me, cardiac is just such a an incredible topic. And as you mentioned, there's medications that we give that are just so different doses that are so different in that realm versus the other and being able to understand those things and see that instant change that you mentioned on some of these coronary syndrome patients or, you know, being able to be with some of these EP patients and see, see that positive movement of these patients from an area of, of a heart failure, an area of just poor hemodynamics or poor perfusion into instant relief or, or a lot better. It's just a gratifying, gratifying place to work. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. Well, Bruce, I am going to ask you to kind of revisit a topic. I know Michael just covered, you know, cardiology and kind of where your passion for that came from, but you, you spoke about your time in the transport industry, both um, in the hospital and then, you know, outside of the hospital and your paramedic background. I think it just gives you such a unique perspective. And there are a lot of nurses who are currently maybe working in the hospital who are interested in the transport industry and just with all of the experience that you've had your background, what would be some points of advice that you would give to them? If they're like, Hey, that's something that interests me. I would like to get into that, but I just really don't even know where to start. 
Yeah, for sure. It's a great question. I, you know, I think um, one thing that has always really kind of bothered me, I think, is that, you know, there's kind of this notion that like you only have to do X, Y, and Z to get into transport. And then once you're there, you can just kind of coast. Um, And that's really not the case at all. I think one of the things that drove me into the transport arena was the fact that there was constant learning that happened. Um, If you weren't actively in transport, kind of the off time was spent either reviewing equipment or updating protocols, et cetera. Um, And so I think that was one of the the foundational pieces that really pulled me into uh, the transport environment. I also uh, think that from my time spent in cardiology, right, you can put a balloon pump in a patient in the cath lab when there's five, six, seven, eight people maybe in in the lab that are there to help out, et cetera. But it's a very different story when it's just you and your partner and you're getting in the aircraft and going out to retrieve a patient that's really not doing well, that is on a balloon pump and, you know, has maybe a pacemaker and things. Um, and really just working with you and your partner to get that person back to more definitive uh, care. Uh, or more specialized care. So I think that was really the first the first piece, and that would really be one suggestion that I have, is to really have an undying thirst for, um, you know, kind of the acquisition of, of knowledge and, and really always pushing yourself to, to learn just a little bit more, challenge yourself on things that you maybe don't know. And, and the transport environment really allows for that, right? Especially when you get into the air side, um, there might be times where you're down for weather or, you know, maybe that your air aircraft is out for maintenance or, you know, uh, various reasons, you know, utilizing that time uh, that you have to really challenge yourself, challenge the information that you currently know with maybe some updates in clinical practice, et cetera. So I think that was, that was one piece of it. The second piece that I would share with folks that are looking to get into it knowledge and skill is definitely an important component of what we do. Um, but I would I would offer that I think something that is equal to that um, is your attitude, you know, kind of staying, um, you know, or, or really allowing for a humility uh, of heart and character to be open um, in, in, you know, in, in understanding kind of yourself uh, and, and your work how you communicate with other people, um, allowing for really a diplomatic presence when you arrive onto the scene of just, you know, complete chaos. You know, I think some of those things that are, that are less easy uh, to be taught really make a huge difference. Um, And I was, I'm very grateful for the mentors uh, that I have had in my life uh, that have really, you know, kind of guided me, especially in those kind of non-tangible, if you will, things. For example, the character and the content of your heart, who you are as a person, embodying things like, you know, being a person of integrity, being a person who is trustworthy, honest, and transparent, um, and really embracing humility from a perspective that you are always willing to learn and have more to learn and have the ability to change your heart and be open and receptive uh, to those those changes. So I think that's really a second piece. And then, you know, the third piece that I think I would offer is I've worked with a, a, with a lot of nurses um, that have come from a variety of backgrounds, and I've precepted several new folks in the transport environment. And I think having um, a good blend of like kind of emergency room, emergency department, trauma, slash like pre-hospital medicine, but also a a solid uh, kind of experience in in critical care, like intensive care, really, really gives you um, the best foundation to be successful in the transport world. I see a fair amount of folks that come in with kind of the attitude that if I've worked in the emergency room for 17 years and I've done some pre-hospital work as maybe a pre-hospital nurse or paramedic, then I'm good to get into a flight nursing role. And I think one of the reasons that we have the pairing we do of a paramedic and a nurse typically on flights or maybe a para, you know a paramedic and a, and a physician or a nurse practitioner and a paramedic, you know whatever the whatever the makeup is, the the nurse i think really needs to bring the the intensive care part of the house because currently in you know in current medical configuration paramedics 
aren't, you know, don't really have true expanded scope. Some hospitals do, but they don't really have a defined role within a hospital. And I think that's really unfortunate because I think they bring a tremendous amount to the table um, and and could be very, uh, you know, super beneficial and it would be beneficial for the system and patients uh, all around. You know, I, I really think that nurses have to have a solid, solid background in, in you know, in intensive care. Um, so either working in a medical surgical ICU or a cardiovascular ICU. Um, I really think that that's important, and I think it makes the transition into the transport environment much more, uh, you know, kind of palatable. So those would kind of be the three things that I would offer. I appreciate you saying that because that's probably one of the best responses that I've heard to a question like that. I've I've been asked that question myself. I've had others that have made statements about how to get into the transport community. And I, I just really appreciate not only the discussion about emergency and critical care, but also about integrity and about having that that passion for education and really trying to push yourself harder. And, you know, you made a statement that the, I think the exact quote was an undying thirst for acquisition of knowledge. And you clearly have that as well. If there's other people interested in becoming an educator, if there's other people interested in pursuing an advanced degree, if we're going to train the next Bruce Hoffman of the world, what are some of the things that we would tell these people so that they can kindle a fire for that undying thirst for the acquisition of knowledge that you mentioned? I'm reflecting as you are as you are kind of speaking. There was a professor out at Carnegie Mellon University, Randy Pausch, and he was diagnosed with a pretty significant abdominal cancer and has you know subsequently uh, passed away. But uh, he gave a, a talk called "The Last Lecture," um, and I was relatively young, and I say young, you know, because the the older that you get, the you know, kind of the more distance, you know. Uh, so what I, I would say I was probably probably, you know, in, in, in undergrad, you know, at the community college in, in nursing school, when I first listened to his, you know, this, this, it's on YouTube, it's called the last lecture. And I remember, you know, him kind of debating on like what to do in his life. And, and, and somebody, you know, said to him, you know, Randy, you're really good at selling things. Why don't you sell education? So, and, and that really, that really hit home with me, right? Instead of selling a tangible product, which is very, is much needed and, and, and a very good thing to do, the, his mentor basically said, you know, why don't you think about being kind of the inspiration for other people uh, to go on? That really struck a, a chord with me. The other uh, piece that really stuck out in that story was he, he talks about having such a unique and very awesome experience in education. Uh, and he really felt a duty or an obligation to turn around and to enable the dreams of other people as they have been enabled for him uh, by some of his academic mentors. And just really that message that that really just it struck me as a young man. And I think that's what really throttled me to go into education was I had had such a beautiful educational experience that I really wanted to turn around and and give that back to other people. You know, as you know, I think we were talking on the phone, I just got accepted into a doctoral program down at Logan University for a doctorate in health professions education. It's a degree that's widely accepted um, and known over in Europe, but it's just slowly making its way here into the United States. Both as a paramedic and a nurse, that degree really appealed uh, to me because nursing and 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 paramedicine are very their educational pathways are very different, and so I I thought that degree would would best fit kind of what I'm looking to do, and I think at the you know at the end of every story that I would love to tell, uh, it would really be to be an inspiration and to create an environment where other people can be successful to have a similar and beautiful experience when they, you know, when they reach out and kind of embrace the, the educational atmosphere. So I would be probably remiss if I did not talk about some of the uh, mentors and some of the folks that um, I have had the privilege of getting to know, being the uh, really the grateful recipient of uh, their mentorship and their kind guidance. Um, I think of, uh, you know, some of my first, you know, faculty folks uh, that I interacted with during my associate degree nursing program, 
um, and some of the professors there. I think about, you know, Eric and Ashley Bauer from, you know, Flight Bridget. I think about Alan Wolf from, from Lifelink 3. I think about Colby Colbett. I think about Janie, right, from BCN, Amy Grand. Just a lot of people, Eric, uh, Eric Miller, Scott DeBoer, you know, there's really kind of this endless list, if you will, of folks that I have gotten to meet along the along the the years. You know, one of the things that I think is is honestly most important when you kind of step into the educational realm. Educators have good days and bad days, just like everybody else does. You know, sometimes you walk out of a lecture and you're like, yeah, I don't know if I was like super, you know, super contagious or if I was able to deliver my message. And my uncle shared with me once, he said, you know, Bruce, sometimes you just have to, you know, take the good and leave the bad. Um, and I thought just how impactful that statement really is. You can you can talk about it on a very superficial level and what it means. But I think from an educational perspective, you know, you always try to take the best out of what people can offer and the stuff that maybe cannot you know, you you leave it, right? And you really try to focus on what people can bring to the table uh, and what they have a willing desire to change uh, within themselves um, and really kind of keeping the focus in that area. So I think those are just a couple of pearls or if you, you know, snippets, if you will, of, you know, kind of my thoughts into education. You know, I think about getting into the the conference lane and and speaking at conferences you know, everybody makes mistakes, right? And, you know, sometimes maybe we didn't understand a topic as thoroughly as we would have liked. It's really our duty and obligation. If if you think that maybe you're not um, sharing, you know, maybe what is the full in-depth story of something, then push yourself and challenge yourself to really figure it out. I remember hearing an older uh, faculty person say sometimes she gets sick of hearing herself talk, right? And and I think there's there's some truth to that, right? Sometimes we, you know, you kind of get in this like lane, you know, you're just kind of sharing what you know, which is helpful, but I think there's always pieces to ourselves that we can challenge. I think again about Eric Bauer, I think about Ashley, I think about uh Tyler Christofoli, Sam Ireland. You know, folks that have 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 really shared kind of the need to look at look within yourself um, a little bit deeper and and try to draw out and and really become the best version of yourself that you uh, that you can be. You know, when you mention that passion for knowledge and things, those are exactly what I hope others that are listening to this it starts to kindle that spark a little bit more to say like what should I do who should I mentor with who should I connect with how should I grow my passion some more so I think it was a perfect response thank you so much for sharing that yeah for sure my grandmother my dad's um, mom her name was Elsa Hoffman she was uh she grew up here in a small town in Ellington uh, Connecticut she passed away a number of years ago uh, from like an Alzheimer's dementia kind of pathology. In her, in in really the time that I was growing up, I had a lot of interaction uh, with her. She was a very influential person in my life, and I remember one of the pieces of of her that I also really see in my dad. Um, you know, obviously, I love both my parents, but I, you know, there's some common threads that I see, um, and I was just, I was always very um, impressed. Uh, and had a tremendous amount of respect for my my grandmother and and my dad. And one of those one of that is really being a, a person of of totality or of wholeness. Um, and I think that really goes back to really the definition of integrity. You know, we we are who we are and be that a hundred percent, right? Kind of living a life of integrity. Um, and keeping that at your core, kind of carrying out your actions with with that in mind through humility and grace and love, I think are really things that framed me as a person and and probably have, you know, have probably led to some measure of, of gratification in all of the things that I have done, you know, up until my life here so far. So, I think you know my my grandmother and my my dad really influenced me in in that uh, you know kind of in that way. Such a good statement, and it always brings me back to those of us who are raising kids right now and who get the privilege of being parents. Like when you hear someone like yourself just talking about how just watching someone with integrity and, and character and people who follow through with what they say and who live a whole life in front of you, just how how that impacted you. Again, it's just a great encouragement. 
I do, I want to revisit nursing education really has evolved, um, has had some, you know, changes. Honestly, in the last five years, I would say, and especially following the pandemic, I think there's been some rethinking about what nursing education needs to look like and has to look like. So really as someone who's going back into school, um, who has been in, in education and, and providing nursing and paramedic, you've, you've kind of run the gamut of that. How, how have you seen it change? And what do you see as the biggest gaps for our profession that are coming and, and how can we, how can we help to fill those gaps? Like what can we do? Um, so interesting conversation, right? And I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, which is that, you know, I would even argue that there has been significant changes over the last year, maybe year and a half, maybe two years, um, kind of crawling out of the uh, the pandemic. And as it kind of hopefully is winding down uh, in some measure, one of the things that, you know, sometimes we're, we're you know, we're not always happy when when things like a pandemic happen. Um, but I think um, something like the pandemic can really put a fair amount of stress on 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 systems. Um, and then you kind of see where some of those less strong uh, areas are with within within the system, right? And and within the you know kind of in this case the realm of of nursing education. The way that I kind of that I explain this is I knew I I, I had a patient that I that I knew that had uh, had a remote uh, motorcycle accident and it just happened to you know have a little bit of headache and whatever. They just wanted to make every you know sure everything was you know good. So they went in. They had like a head CT in the emergency room and you know you know, kind of, they weren't looking for it, but they ended up finding a pretty significant brain tumor on, on CT. And then, you know, they were admitted to neurosurgery. They had the tumor excised and, you know, all is well that ends well. Um, but the reason that I share that is because sometimes, um, you know, you're, you're kind of like, oh, should I go to the hospital? Should I not? And then like you do, and then they find, you know, something and it ends up being, you know, kind of quote unquote, a good thing. Um, I, that's kind of a little bit how I see the, you know, kind of the, the entrance of COVID and its effect on nursing, you know, kind of in general, but especially nursing education, you know, it, it was not a good thing to go through, but there were things that we have learned coming out of it that provide opportunity for us to, um, you know, change. I think one of the the barriers um, that that I think we're working on and that we're we're kind of coming to address is interdisciplinary work is a good thing, and and what I mean by that is you know, nurses are experts in, in, in a lot of things. But but I would go so far as to say, I don't know that one genre of, of employment, as in like nursing, is an expert in everything, right? And so the classic example that I've kind of shared is that, you know, you have a nurse who works in public health, who maybe has never directly dealt with hazardous materials, right? Um, but you have, you know, maybe you can link up with like a fire chief or something like that, who has extensive experience dealing with hazmat and some of that stuff. It's okay to have that expert, right? That fire chief come in and talk to a group of students and, and convey really expert knowledge on, you know, kind of some of the facts of hazardous materials, et cetera, bioterrorism. And then the nursing faculty kind of come in and and bring to light some of the nursing considerations in light of that category. And I slowly kind of started to see that, I think, in nursing education, where there's a little bit more of an openness to say, you know, nursing really is not just an isolated silo. We work with physical therapy, occupational therapy, respiratory therapy, the medical side of the house, the EMS side of the house, et cetera. And so the, you know, kind of the more that I um, am in nursing education and really education in general, I see a, a much stronger push for that. And I think just by nature of doing that, some of these gaps will get filled um, and it will further promote collaboration really between all of the folks that get involved in a, you know, in a patient's continuum, right, in a, in a patient's life. And then using some of those, you know, experts and things like that, and maybe the non-nursing experts, uh, to really help us and work collaboratively with nursing to build a system that actually works. 
you know, I think right now I've seen on Facebook and certainly Facebook is far from being the telltale of everything, but I saw an interesting, you know, kind of cartoon where, you know, it was basically, uh, you know, a healthcare provider holding up a patient's bed above water so that the patient was able to survive, but subsequently the, the healthcare provider is drowning, right? And so, I, you know, I think the more that we kind of see some of these things and have a realization that maybe we don't have the perfect, you know, healthcare system with within our, you know, within our area, that I hope we become a little bit more open um, to change. And, and that really starts with the individual. I, I think sometimes there's there's this element, and I'm I'm smirking when I say this, because I probably haven't thought it out entirely. But we, we say all the time, you know, people say, "Oh, change takes time," and I think about that like in the context of a mother driving some children home from a football game, and you know, a driver misses a stop sign and plows into their van, and those lives at that moment are changed forever. That that change did not take a long time. I think sometimes what we have a hard time within the human race is understanding. I think, I don't think change takes a long time. Yes, there are certain processes and things that, you know, have to go through evolutions, but um, sometimes I think it's our receptiveness to the change that is maybe more what we're describing, right? Sometimes our ability to understand um, and and come to terms with why things are are changing, I think, is sometimes where we see the the long turnover. I'm I'm optimistic. I am. I think the more that we work together, you know, and and really put you know the patient and the team at the center of what we do, um, I'm hopeful that we can kind of maintain a healthcare system that can keep us and my generation, which is becoming older, can keep us, you know, and help us to be, you know, healthy and and safe. You know, I would also probably be a little bit remiss if I didn't mention here, I wrote an article for uh, EMS World, I think it was in like 2020, 2021. And it basically was advocating for the role of a critical care paramedic in the hospital. And I was just having this discussion, I would love to hear, you know, kind of your your thoughts on it, uh, Holly and Michael. I I said, I, why, like, why is it that we haven't like fully embraced, right? Paramedics in the, in the hospital, right? Paramedics, you step like two feet outside the hospital and, and they're called for base, you know, 911. They're the, they're the 911 of the system, right? Paramedics and EMTs, uh, fire, law enforcement, et cetera. Paramedics, the term paramedic for me, um, I really struggle with because I think it's kind of a limiting term, right? When I think of like the paravertebral arteries, right? Those are the arteries that kind of lie outside of, right? The ver- vertebral bodies. Um, paramedics don't really work on the outskirts, right? Of medicine. They, we do practice medicine, right? In, in a way um, as, as, as paramedics. So I don't know. I, I would love to see, I think there's a lot of value that different roles can bring, um, and I would love to see us continue to work uh, more collaboratively um, in really pushing the fringes of paramedic education, pushing the fringes of EMT education, um, you know, speaking from, from a medical perspective, so that we can really meet the demands that is that are coming, right, that are coming down the pike um, towards us. So I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. I, you know, I think sometimes it just takes people kind of looking outside of themselves, uh, looking at the greater good and, um, you know, embracing things with a measurement of humility and, uh, you know, just uh, working, working together. I was kind of chuckling to myself thinking, do we need to have an after show podcast where we go jump into all these (laughs) some more? But (laughs) Uh, because I have a lot of thoughts and ideas on even just that one topic of paramedics in in hospital facilities too. So I would love to go down those with you, but for the sake of time um, and for the sake of possibly having an after show, do you, uh, I I do want to turn it back to um, a question that we like to ask every single guest. And um, it is, 
It is a question that I've had some very unexpected answers on. So you have talked about different names and you've talked about uh, teachers, you've talked about uh, coworkers, you've talked about people that have inspired you. And um, maybe the answer to this is a patient. I don't know. Maybe it's your grandmother. But is there a person or a moment in your career that has greatly impacted you as an individual, you as a professional? There's so many, so many people out there, so many patients, so many students just in in very different paths of mine um, that have just been tremendous role models and, you know, provided, I don't like to call it constructive criticism. I like to call it constructive feedback, right? They're really building you up to become uh, really a better version of of yourself. Um, And so, that list could go, I mean, that list could go on and on. I think about Ginger Locke. I think about Ashley Liebig. I think about Peter, you know, Antevi. I think about Jeff Jarvis, Ratu Sani, um, Dan Davis, just uh, Jim DeCanto, just tons of people that I have had the privilege of just sitting down, maybe it's after a conference and you're sitting right across from them, right? Um, the demonstration of humility, extreme intelligence, knowing how to communicate and live uh, just a good, wholesome life. Um, Just uh, I'm, it makes me, it it almost makes me a little bit emotional, but it just, it makes me um, very thankful um, for kind of the, all, all the things that have transpired um, in, in my life. That's awesome. Thank you again for sharing that with us. We are going to move to our rapid fire questions um, where we ask you just some of your favorites really, so that we can get to just know you a little bit, You know, I mean, we've gotten to know some of your accomplishments and your nursing and paramedic background, but now let's get to know you a little bit as a person. So what would you be doing if you were not in your current role? When I was uh, about seven, eight, nine years old, we had to fill out a little book. What would you want to be in the future? And I wrote down a marine biologist, and I think I could still go back to that today. Uh, love spending time in the water, love uh, time with a scuba tank on my uh, on my back, and uh, just down in the water, getting to see what's down there. It's just uh, uh, like exploring a whole new world. So that's what I would be doing if I were not in this role right now. I'm not going to lie that that was probably something at the age of six or seven that I wanted to do, but I'll be real. I only thought that involved swimming with dolphins. I didn't realize that it was a bit more extensive than that. I just thought you just swam with dolphins the whole time. So three categories we're going to kind of ask you about that are your favorites. Again, this can be your favorite current or it can be favorite of all time. So what is your favorite TV show? Sure. Uh, House MD. I don't know what it was. I kind of watched it when I was in nursing school or or maybe it was in like maybe one of my graduate programs, but I could go back to that and watch the entire series from cover to cover again uh, anytime. I kind of like a little bit of sarcasm um, and, you know, kind of the medical mystery model um, and, and things like that. So a lot to relate to uh, there, but I love that show. I'm with you on that as well. I loved his sarcasm and I loved how no matter what they presented with, it was never going to be what they presented with. Like there was always something deeper, something different, like every show, every patient, every scenario they gave you, it's not what they're telling us. It is, you know, patients lie, like they said. So I I was like, man, this show, it, it is, it's, it's, it's ironic and edgy. And then lo and behold, when I got into nursing, I realized there is an edge of truth to all of this. So, um, <laughs> your favorite movie? Uh, favorite movie is Freedom Writers. It was uh, came out in two thousand seven, um, and uh, it's it's a movie. It's a little bit um, cliche. Uh, But it's just a movie that kind of was very inspirational for me, um, kind of, you know, kind of getting into education. I watched it a few years after it came out. um, And just, you know, there are some very impactful scenes in that movie, um, you know, for, you know, kind of inspiring students, um, meeting students where they're at, right, and then encouraging them to go a little bit further. So just a lot of uh, kind of uh, pearls. Awesome. Thank you for that. I believe that I've seen that movie before, but you talking about it, I'm like, man, I probably need to go revisit that. So thank you for that. For um, sure. Next up will be your favorite musical artist. Uh, Eddie Van Halen. So I know probably some people are like, oh, OMG, right? Like, what is he doing? 
I, I, when I got to, uh, to work in the cath lab, we'd have to go in right at like all hours of the night. And so if we got called in, I lived about 20, uh, 28 minutes, 27 minutes away from our cath lab. So I could go home um, and our pager would go off. I'd like, you know, jump up, get out to my car and you know, you're tired, right? It's like two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. So I um, downloaded a whole series of like, just, you know, Van Halen, like, core tunes um and i just remember it didn't matter if it was winter summer spring fall i would have the windows down bombing down the highway and just rocking uh van halen and just a great way to kind of like get you jazzed up for what you're about to do and uh just to to wake up but like on top of the world right there's just like some classic and you know like just amazing you know guitarist and i you know i didn't really listen to him as a kid but definitely kind of kind of burning midnight oil a little bit um van halen was was there for me and to this day even with the kids in the car if we're like going somewhere right and a van halen song comes on crank it all the way up and we're just we're bombing down the highway living the good life you know you gotta you gotta pass that on to the next generation so they can really understand what is music like for sure i mean we need to give them some good comparisons um okay what is your comfort food or meal that you really enjoy uh so like um this is actually a good question so like rice or like a teriyaki bowl right like rice with like vegetables chicken teriyaki that kind of thing all blended together dynamite right and and totally a uh a comfort uh thing for me so uh, last question outside of nursing, outside of paramedic, what other hobbies or interests do you have? I am a huge aviation buff. So, um, kind of commercial aviation, uh, you know, kind of being in or around, uh, planes just is my jam, right? If you can, that's why flight nursing was such a big deal to me, uh, because it was like combining two of the best things huge aviation buff. I will take my kids over to our uh, local airport and we'll just like grab some ice cream or something and uh, jump out the sunroof and just uh, watch some planes come in. We just had uh, Air Force One stop by. All things aviation, whether it's a helicopter, airplane, commercial, private, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I love it all. So. Okay. Well, Bruce, if our audience would like to follow you online, what social media platforms um, might they be able to do that on? Uh, so I'm on Twitter, uh, Bruce, uh, B-R-U-C-E, um, E as in Echo, and then Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, Bruce E. Hoffman on Twitter. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bruce, for being with us today, for sharing all of your insight and all the information that you provided regarding healthcare in general, whether it's pre-hospital, whether it's transport, intra-facility, um, talking about education, just really great conversation with you today. And I really, really appreciate your insight and your honesty and just your openness and willingness to share with us and with those that are listening. So thank you. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I want to take this time to thank Bruce for joining us for this episode of BCN and Friends. Thank you, Bruce, for sharing your knowledge, your passion, your time with us. And we're looking forward to spending some face-to-face time with Bruce in Charlotte, North Carolina at BCN Learn Live in November, the 13th through the 15th of 2023. So you can check out the registration information at bcn.org and you can come and meet us in Charlotte. And to all of our listeners, we hope that you will stay tuned as we continue with BCN and Friends and bring you new, meaningful content and perspectives. If you have a suggestion for an episode, please email us at bcn at bcn.org. I'm Holly Briggs here with Michael Dexter. And on behalf of the entire BCN team, we thank and celebrate you for all that you're doing as professional nurses across the emergency spectrum. Until next time, we are out.